who writes and speaks um, about culturally responsiveness in sorry people are messaging me who writes and speaks about culturally responsiveness in education clinical practice and community building she's written two books on latinx and black culture and online spaces and she is currently the national chair for the council for at-risk student education and profession professional standards she's been recognized by the california state legislature for a bold commitment to change in education and she works she offers workshops on topics related to building community and culture in online spaces, effective culturally responsive teaching, and best practices. She was also highlighted in Flower Darby's book, Small Teaching Online, regarding student culture and online spaces. In 2022, she released her latest book, Cultural Intentions. So at this point, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Plotz, and I look forward to hearing from you today. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How, how is everyone? Hopefully everyone's having a good morning so far. I, I am pained that I am not like part of the cool crew. So I have to figure out a way um, to make that happen because uh, that just that just seems like a really cool kind of thing that you do, no pun intended. And um, I think that a lot of people probably really benefit from uh, all the work that's being done. So um, I want to start off with we're, we're talking about um, connection and culture today, and I'm so excited to be with you and um, you can feel free to use this or Kim is going to post a link in the chat um, and we're going to start off with kind of this pre conference um, idea about um, kind of what cultural responsiveness is. So if you could just go ahead um, and use the link or use the QR code, um, a couple of your um, colleagues have already responded and there's some other um, posts in there that are from other trainings that I've done. So I left some of those in there. Um, and so feel free to just kind of participate in that just to give us an idea of kind of what some of those challenges are. Everything that you post in there will be anonymous. Um, so you don't have to um, worry about that um, unless you want to put your name. You can see some people um, from other trainings have put their, their face and their name. Um, but, but what is the challenge with cultural responsiveness? Um, and, and it's a big term, and, and I really want to start from a place of kind of understanding that no matter where you are on when you think of DEI work um, or DEIA work, or if you call it JEDI or whatever, whatever those terms are that are comfortable for you, um, it's a big, big word, right? When we put those words together, it's a big concept. And that's how we know professionally that we have to start helping people specialize um, within that because a lot of people who do the work are departments of one. Um, and so, um, and that could mean that they're just the one person in the department who kind of has, you know, this affinity for cultural responsiveness, and deal work or it's maybe um it's literally a person that's one department so um and a couple things so for the agenda today um just have your phones ready um again kim will be posting links if that's easier for people but we're going to frame the discussion around culture we're going to look at a faculty case study about why culture was so important and what happened during the pandemic and then we're going to look at what's called a prescriptive model so if you have questions um i think kim is monitoring the chat feel free to ask whatever question um, kim and i have already discussed beforehand if you need to stop me in mid flow just stop um if we have you know an important question or we can and, you know, if you want to hold your question and wait until the end, that's fine too. So this is kind of what we're looking at today. So let's talk about what those important things are. So why is why is there such a difficulty in in overcoming some of the challenges that you may have posted about? Why is it so difficult when we say something like cultural responsiveness? You know, what does that mean, and why is it so difficult? Well. Number one is I found, and I don't know if it's true for, for you as well, but there are two groups of people in the world who like guarantees, and it's usually educators and students, right? Students want to know, if I do this, will I get this grade? And a lot of faculty members want to know, if I do this, will I get tenure? If I do this, will I get my stipend? Or if we do this, does this mean X, Y, or Z result is going to happen? And right now, um, the, historically, the way that the work has been um, 
done around cultural responsiveness and, and other topics has been very generalized, which has made it very difficult for some people to understand the concepts associated with it. Right? So, so some people will say, well, culture, when you say cultural responsiveness, that means all and nothing at the same time. Like it means everything and it means nothing. So depending on who you're talking to and their experiences with cultural responsiveness, um, that it could feel very different, right, for, from person. And I think we had some shifting in flight. So I, I, the, all these slides looked right on my side, and I tried to move the ones that I could. So I apologize for for some of the the movement. Um, so the the main thing is is most faculty, when you talk to them and instructional designers, they don't want to get it wrong. They're not they're they're not having the intention of wanting to do the work wrong, but nobody's really told them to do it right. And so that's where it leaves people kind of in this fight, fight or freeze mode. I, I can't, I, I know I need to do it. I want to do it, but I don't know how to do it. So I'll just freeze. Um, and they might not feel as confident as they would like to in, you know, in, in the skills that they have or the skills that they're developing. The other thing is, again, people need to see the value in cultural responsiveness. So some people just don't see the value in it, right? And so that makes it hard to apply to, you know, um, you know, across an institution. So that can be difficult as well. Um, again, we talk about some people are on culturally responsive islands. It's just them, right? It's just them. And when we talk about cultural responsiveness, a lot of times when you look at the research, students aren't included in the process. So that's challenging because it usually, when I'm asked to come somewhere, unless it's something like this, right, or a training, if it's consulting work, it's usually because something has happened at the campus and, and people are putting out fires. Um, and students, when it comes to cultural responsiveness, a lot of times people don't ask the students. Um, you, you will see polls that come out um, from um, DEI offices about, you know, just kind of um, more, more of the social side of things when you're talking about DEI work. Um, D, I, can, I, I always say DIA work. What, what is someone post in the chat? What terms are you familiar with in Kentucky? Is it is it DIA work? Is it D, I know it's different all over the country. So I just want to make sure I'm using terms that you do. Okay, DEI. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, DIA. Okay, I just want to make sure that that term, you know, those were the terms that were being used there. So you have that. And then the, the last challenge is that people are super complex. Thank you. Yeah, DI, DB. Okay, perfect. Yeah, whatever terms that make sense to your brain, you know, just insert if I'm using the one that you're not familiar with. Um, so the challenge is, is that people are complex, right? And so when we look at this picture of the stadium, everyone is experiencing something. Something is happening in that environment, but how it's perceived is different among every single person in that stadium because um, of past history, because of the way that their brain is wired, because of the person next to them, because of their sense of smell, taste, touch, right? So, so the challenge is, is that when we, when we think about cultural responsiveness in general, um, it's, it's a complex concept because people are complex, but culture is also complex. So the question becomes now, when we think about why people are resistant to um, cultural responsiveness, a lot of times it's because it's from a deficit mindset. And people say, I hear this all the time. People tell me, uh, they'll say to me, well, Courtney, I have 500 students. Uh, how can I be culturally responsive to each of my students? Um, and if you think about it that way, and if we use statistics, statistics will tell us the probability is that it's pro you probably cannot do that um, for a variety of reasons. Because um, on average, ten if you take ten random people, one of those one of those people you're not going to get along with. No matter no matter how much you change yourself, no matter how much they change, that's not going to change, right? So statistically, personality wise, that's a thing. And then add all you know a whole bunch of differences on top of that. Um, whether they're actual or perceived, that's that's going to be very challenging. But if we kind of change our mindset and we say, okay, no matter who I am, I recognize that the teaching strategies that I'm using and the education system that I was um, a part of, whether that's working or being the person who's obtaining education, um, if we say that we understand that historically that's been that's been using one lens right that's one eurocentric lens and we say what can we do to add to that lens that has other 
ethnic cultures in mind. That's, that's shifting things because it's bringing things into focus and it's saying, okay, I recognize that no matter who I am, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what race, I only have my own experience. So the question is, is how can I bring that experience and my learning and what I know to a group of students who may or may not be representative of who I am as a person? And again, because people, a lot of people take the global view, that stuff magnifies in online spaces. And that's because um, naturally in face-to-face -face settings, people, um, people kind of use the social cues that are in that space. But in online learning and online spaces, it requires facilitation. Um, when we look at traditional methods of online teaching, it's very task oriented. Um, it's very checklisty, right? Um, that's a very Eurocentric concept. When when you talk about culture and mixing culture and education, right? It's very task oriented. There's no there's very little relationship building. Um, when you look at how most online departments run and they have a new faculty, particularly adjuncts, the adjuncts are welcomed, and then there's a giant checklist, right? And these are all the things that have to happen before you you know do whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, the other thing is, is when we look at the, the, the research on online learning, um, it really, you see a lot about critical thinking and, and even just education in general, it's critical thinking, critical thinking, which is important. And, and I want to drive home the point that this doesn't mean that we stop and throw away everything that we've been doing, right? It doesn't mean you have to get rid of everything that we've been doing because some of the stuff we've been doing works, but we're just adding to from a different lens, right? So a lot of cultures in general, um, especially collective cultures, uh, they have divergent thinking happen before critical thinking. So divergent thinking is kind of that out of the box thinking where when you look at the literature, everything is critical thinking, critical thinking, critical thinking. Well, in a lot of collective cultures, you wouldn't do critical thinking before you had the out of the box thinking. So that's, that's one of the things that's kind of skewing practice. Um, and again, it creates this all or nothing view of what cultural responsiveness is in our classrooms. And that's become a challenge. And that's not anyone's fault. That's just the way that the literature kind of lined up because we've focused on these things like, you know, the concept of self-motivation and self-efficacy. Um, and I don't know, um, how many of you remember, and you can just type in the chat, do you, do you all remember maybe 10 years ago, there was that whole push for um, grit and determination? How many of you remember that? and determination we were really focusing on that maybe like 2010 yeah remember that yeah so yeah it was yeah 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 exactly exactly yeah so so one of the challenges with that just culturally is it's very it's a very difficult sell and i'm not trying to speak on behalf of people from other cultures or even people from the cultures that i'm familiar with um but one of the things that really hit home with me is whoever created that did not have a cultural lens approach at all because it's really something to tell a group of people who've historically been marginalized um particularly when you're talking about indigenous communities well if you just hang in there a little bit more and have a little bit more grit it'll all be great it's like well the fact that I'm just living and the fact that my family members are still alive and they survived your Native American school should say something, but yet it was that grit and determination, grit, grit and determination. And so, so it, it does these, it, it, you know, there's these kind of weird things that happen in the literature that, that just don't really represent or aren't really thought through well. And that's because it's one, um, Tekken talks about this. Thank you, Missy. Yeah, it's just that that one piece, right? So, so the question is, is why would we be culturally responsive, right? And you, and we're going to talk about what cultural responsiveness is in a second. But why would you want to be culturally responsive? And the answer, in truth, is that we've known for years that cultural responsiveness is a prescription, and I use that term lightly, um, a, a prescription for decreasing acculturative stress. So when people have um, a stress response that's based out of a cultural shift, you would need to be culturally responsive in order to take that stress down and have them um, function at, at what most people would consider their personal baseline. And and again, this, this research is old. We've known this. We've known that cultural responsiveness minimizes acculturative stress. And when we can minimize acculturative stress, we can also minimize the anxiety and depression um, that's associated with 
uh, acculturated stress. And we also know that acculturated stress is a byproduct of racism. So when people have experienced racism, stereotyping, bias, um, there's a stress that comes with that. And, and this, is, this is the point that I want to drive home because there are two sides to to when you when you think about marginalization and talk about marginalization. So I just want to make sure that we're clear on what that means. What most people are familiar with is the social context, particularly in the last five to 10 years, there's been a big push for social justice. Um, these things are um, are important. Um, and what you're probably used to hearing is, is the term marginalization in a social context, which means there's some institution, there's some, you know, machine of some sort, whether it be the criminal justice system or the education system or the government that is, you know, um, that is uh, marginalizing a group of people, whether that's taking away their rights or not treating people fairly. And that's absolutely important. Um, and a lot of the um, social justice work um, focuses on the, those kind of, those pieces of it. But when you look at the psychological side, the psychological side looks at the difference. And here's the example I wanna give you. And you can just type in the chat and you can just use one word, or if you like to write, obviously you can use more. Um, but what what would be the positives of society if if we today could stop anything negative happening that's associated with race or culture or what what are some of the positive things that could happen if we did that if we could just wave a magic wand and say okay yes that like that it's it's done yeah there's there's uni there's unity people are united. What else? What are some of those positive things that would happen if we could just stop understanding mm -hmm, improved health? Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Peace. People would feel seen and appreciated. Poverty lessons. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Excellent. And so so here's the challenge. All of that is true. Right. Let's just assume that everything, no matter what you put in the chat, is true. So if we could stop that from happening what do we do with the effects of the stuff that already happened? So if we stop racism today, right, that doesn't mean that everything before that isn't impacting the individual, right? Even if we stop, we would have these great outcomes, but the, the, the people who've experienced something negative would still have the residual from what already happened. So the question is, is what are we doing with that? And that's what I look at. I look at the individual and the context of an individual, not the system. Because even if you fix the system, there are people that have already been harmed by it one way or another. Um, and some systems don't, don't harm people based on ethnicity either. It could be by social class, it could be by age. So, so it, it really matters, you know, as far as our learning environments, are we developing things that really kind of help reduce that stress? And the answer is usually no, because people are, are the way we've been taught to teach doesn't address this. Um, so let's just do a, a I'm going to give you an example of, of this in, in faculty terms. Um, and this is really a passion of mine because faculty health and wellness has been on the back burner um, since COVID. And I really just want to share my appreciation for whatever work you did during the pandemic. Um, I appreciate your contributions to the students and to the body of education as a whole. Um, it wasn't easy to do. And we had this thing that happened where people were saying things like, well, we're gonna return to work. Well, what do you think people were doing? <laughs> What, what what is it that you thought people were doing? And of course, were there some people who weren't working? Yes, yes. But guess what? They weren't working on your campus either. So it didn't matter. The point is, is that, you know, there was a, there was, you know, a big shift in culture. And so I, I want to give you this example. So I'm going to take you back to 2020. And I love this guy's face because he just looks like he just heard about the pandemic. Someone just said to him, hey, listen, the world's shutting down, take your stuff, we're gonna move online, right? Now, some of you have been working online, so this is no different for you. Um, and so, so what happened was, you, especially for my people who love their routines, um, some of you have been had the same routine for two, five, 10, 25 years. And it is, you leave your house, you get in your car, you park in your space, you high five your student, you walk to your classroom, then you go see your colleague. And that happened every day. And that's part of your work culture. And so what happened was we had 
faculty, so, so that culture was removed from people and that caused a culturative stress in people because that culture was removed and you, it, was, it wasn't only removed, but you were asked to rebuild something completely different. Because as we know, remote, remote work culture is very different than campus culture. Um, and so some faculty were so excited. They were like, yes, this is my Super Bowl. I've been telling my boss for years we should be online. I've got tutorials set up. I'm going to lead the team, right? And then you had what was called integrate people, integrated faculty members. And, and what those folks did is say, they took a really deep breath and they said, I don't like it. I get it, but I don't like it. I will finish out my class the same way that I will, that I would have otherwise, but I'm ready to go back in the fall. Like I do not, you know, I, I will do what I need to do and I will, I will, you know, do it accordingly, but it, it really, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to kind of digest this and do what I need to do. Then we had separated faculty and you know the separated faculty because someone told them that they were going to be working from home and on that day they gave their final and they put in final grades and they were done. They were like, never the two shall meet. My home is my home. <laughs> My work life is my work life and that's it because the, those cultural differences are so stark and so sacred in different places that the, that would, that it just, it was a very difficult sell for that group. And then you had the group of faculty who responded with marginalization and that that jump of culture was so great. That removal of the campus culture that they were used to was so great that they just kind of froze and anything that was there was exacerbated. If there was a little bit of depression, it got bigger. If there was a little bit of anxiety, it got bigger. And it just kind of felt all consuming to the point where it was extremely difficult to get motivated. People were um, very challenged by even just engaging, right? Just engaging with peers, right? This is where you saw a lot of cameras off for a long time. And this was the same for our students. And again, on the psychological side, this isn't this what you're you're not saying someone's marginalizing themselves. What you're saying is, is that they are responding to the lack of culture or the culture that's in place. They are responding to that level of stress by doing X. If you're not saying someone is marginalizing themselves by oppressing themselves. That's not what you're saying. That's a different that's a different um, that's a different scope of that. So the challenge for us as educators, right, is that that the brain can only do so much of two things at once. So so when students or faculty feel marginalized in in uh, or feel culturative stress levels and it gets to the point of marginalization, the brain will do lifeguarding before it will do learning because the person is trying to guard themselves in their space and get kind of the perception that they need or want to have to feel safe. So that's why if you've ever been in a situation where you're trying to learn and you feel really stressed out, it's very difficult to memorize things, right? Or you memorize them and the next day that they're gone. Um, we see that a lot when the marginalization um, strategy is used and when the acculturative stress is high. So I'm gonna pause here. Are there any questions before we move forward? Um, if you wanna check in the chat, Kim, are we just kind of good, we're cruising? We don't have any questions in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Perfect, okay, so, so, so then you say to yourself, well, Courtney, that's not true of everybody because what, what about the, the students who are marginalized and they do fine in academics and they, they don't have any, you know, challenges or anything like that in the, in the academic space. Well, yeah, that's right. That's due to personal preference. It's due to their own personal determination. It's due to personality. But it's this is why it's so important to understand that people experiencing a culturative stress um, the levels look different and there's a way to measure that and I can show you that in a second. Um, we'll talk about that later on. But, but the bottom line is, is that each person is an individual. So some things, when you look at something like universal design, it's, it's good in theory because there's lots of choices for lots of people. Um, but then some people just want one choice. They, it's too overwhelming for them to think of multiple at once. So sometimes it could, that can be overwhelming as well. 
So how many of you, and just type in the chat, how many of you are um, familiar with the community of inquiry model? You can just type a yes or no. Does it look familiar to you? I know my online folks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, community, good, good, good. Perfect. So community of inquiry theory, um, it was made by, oh, this is all cut off. Sorry, it's cutting off because it shifts in your, this, this is from our system and it's shutting off, it's cutting off pieces of my presentation, but that's okay. Um, so you guys know Garrison, Archer, and Anderson, those are kind of the writers. And we're going to talk to them. We're going to talk. Oh, that's good. Yeah, no, but it's like the author got cut off, like it's shifting. So the pictures are overlapping, but it's okay. Um, so, so the question is, is, so we're using this model, but what about this model considered culture? Because the way that people connect and think about things um, has a lot to do with their experiences, has a lot to do with how these um, concepts uh, are, are kind of situated in other people's culture, right? So for instance, one of the, one of a, a basic example is something like time right it's a very eurocentric concept to to even say something like time management right because to manage your time you'd have to know how much time you have that's a very kind of master of my own destiny kind of thought process right so you can ex the, the the culturally responsive thing to think about is how do you want to experience your time since you don't know how much time you have you know um how would you want to do that now if you're talking about groups and and you think you know, I'm, I think enough time for this assignment is 45 minutes, right? Well, depending on who's in that group, that could be way too much time. That could be not enough time, right? And a lot of that isn't necessarily based on skill. It's just based on what people, people um, think about or, you know, what, how, they, how they perceive that. So, so the question is, is if we have marginalization in this, in this space and we have a culture of stress, how, how do we do how do we teach in a way that kind of helps our students and kind of makes more sense as a whole? Because again, I think one of the challenges is a lot of faculty members feel when you're talking about cultural responsiveness, it's something else I have to do. Um, does, does anyone feel like that? I know I did when I first started teaching. I felt like when I started doing D, DEI work, um, it, I was in a very um, kind of transactional environment and it was just like no one could like I, I understand as a BIPOC person why I why it's important why we need to do it but the way it was presented it felt very tasky um, and and it did it wasn't helping it was it wasn't it wasn't making me feel like one that people actually cared about it and two um, yeah just change not more exactly exactly yeah we have something else we have to figure out how to implement right right exactly and so that's why um in this presentation i really hope to just support you in kind of your current framework and really you know look at that a little bit differently so so here's the three things so no matter how you teach or what you teach you can add one of these next three things to how you do what you do so the first thing is that there's a model called the cultural lens approach and that's by harden and harden basically says look everything that we do ever has is influenced by culture and the education research never addresses that and we need to so it's ba basically her 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 and her colleagues premise is when you're thinking about doing what you're doing just think about culture right just just think about it just think about how this may or may not impact other people um, that may or may not look like myself right and so for for, but for COI, if you're if you're familiar with community of inquiry theory, um, yeah, see, it's like it's like shrinking. Sorry, I, I'm just catching these things now because it didn't look like this on my side, but it's something about collaborate or collab that's like shrinking and whatever. Anyway, um, so so the cultural presence model. So what this is is I looked at this, I looked at COI, and I said, okay, what about these things are not including collective cultures? So again people have to want to do culturally responsive works oh thank you thank you patricia i'll do that next time i'll do that next time and you can follow along on the app that'll be it'll have everything so it won't get cut off um so intentionality um and then there's transactional versus relational we kind of talked about that as well right when we think about online learning it's it's kind of based on i'm going to put up something you're going to complete it i'm going to grade it 
I'm going to give you feedback and then you're going to build on the next time, which is, which is also the same in, in, in face to face, but face to face students are um, a lot of times uh, more I don't want to say willing, but more able to kind of create the relationships they need and want um, because there's not that transactional distance there of the computer, right? So they're able to tap the person next to them. Hey, you know, what are we doing? Now, if some of you know each other, so some of you right now could be texting each other, right? Because you have a relationship and you're, you're asking a question or you're, you know, talking to each other about the topic or me or whatever. Um, so, so that's, that's one of those things is, you know, where are our channels for that relationship building? And when I say relationship, um, it doesn't mean everyone's going to be best friends, right? It means what is the uh, what is the relation or the commonality between people in a virtual space. Then you've got collaborative and contextual learning. So a lot of it, a lot of the research says, OK, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. But that means very different things across cultures, especially when you're looking at things like leadership um, and power dynamics. Um, you know, I know some people and especially I think these things are harder to do in a lot of the, the STEM fields, because if if you're working, especially when you're talking about engineering and stuff, like there is a lead engineer, right? There is a lead person, there is, you know, those steps. So, so um, that's not necessarily going to translate to the real world when you get there. Um, everyone on this call has had a terrible boss. Um, or I shouldn't say that almost everyone on this call, right? But most of the times in a group this small, we can all agree that we worked with someone, whether they're our boss, our supervisor, our colleague they, 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 it just wasn't a good fit right and then we have interdependence versus dependent and independence versus interdependence and so a lot of people again when you look at the literature it says oh students students who are successful online are independent right they are self-motivated self-guided self 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 but the concept of self is again a very individualistic concept um and so Truthfully, when you look at students who were successful in face-to-face -face or online, um, what you're really seeing is interdependence. A successful student makes a network to be successful and they have a relationship with your syllabus, they have a relationship with you, they have a relationship with someone in the classroom. And that doesn't mean, again, that you're best friends with your students. It means that there are lines of communication and all of those things are used to be successful. If our students were truly independent learners, they wouldn't need us. Um, they wouldn't need anything. They don't need a syllabus. They don't need anything. We're just kind of leaving them to their own devices. And eventually they turn something in and we grade it and we're done. And so, and, and again, we already talked about convergent and divergent thinking. All right. So let's say that you're a Blooms user. You really like Blooms. It's what you're used to. When you think about Blooms, it was made in 1956. So in 1956, who were the people in college? You can text in the chat. When you think of the predominantly, um, you know, who was predominantly going to college in 1956, what did that makeup look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. Debbie Justice, what a great name. Justice, that's great. Yeah, wealthier. Yeah, yeah. It was a social. Yeah, it was the it was the upper echelon. It was white men. It was there were the women were barely making inroads at that point. But yet we're still using this. Now, does it mean that we need to throw blues away? No, <laughs> they look like me with more money. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's the thing. Um, and so so we're still using that model. We're using blooms and. And there's nothing wrong with blooms, but it makes a lot of assumptions. So when you look at blooms, it starts with knowledge. You say, okay, here's what, here's some definitions that you need to know. And and were there white men who went to college who probably didn't belong? Yes. Did they experience a culture of stress? Yes. In the same way that the first person of color who went to a predominantly white institution experienced that? No. So so you have to ask yourself, if I'm using Blooms and I want to use Blooms, what would be those things that I'd have to consider while I'm using Blooms? And, and really, it comes down to what's called norming. And the question is, is before you start teaching, is there something in the environment that is a visual cue, whether in your syllabus, in your classroom, in your, in your online space, in your face-to-face -face class, that people can either self-identify with 
or it begins to build a sense of belonging or community. Um, some people do activities in their classroom, so maybe that's it. Um, some people do icebreakers, but icebreakers can be very overwhelming for people, um, especially when they don't know who else is in the class. So I highly recommend doing something that's more like a, like a mixer, um, because if you've noticed, um, as you know, during the pandemic and even now, you know, I can ask, like I asked Kim, I said, hey, Kim, does anyone have any questions? She's like, no, it looks good. But if I put you in small groups right now, you probably have more to talk about, right? You, you don't want to have those conversations in front of everyone, right? Especially if I've heard the two people in front of me say, you know, my favorite thing to do is go skiing. Well, one, I don't like the cold and two, I can't afford to ski. So now I'm already feeling like, hey, I, maybe I don't belong here. And, and, and again, it's not, we can't fix all of our students' challenges. We cannot. Um, and, and this is a point I want to drive home. And we were talking about this um, at American Catholic University because one of their concerns was a faculty member brought up the concern that they were really overwhelmed by the mental health side of teaching because they said so many of uh, my students have come to me with mental health issues and I'm trying to help them. Um, we need to be really clear on where the lines for teachers are with mental health because teachers, faculty members, instructional designers are not counselors. They are not psychologists. They are not you know, they, they, so so it's it, it, it we want to be really clear on where that line is. Um, and so, you know, again, just moving up, these these are just the things that that we can add to blooms um, to help to help um, people just kind of norm to the learning environment. So again, how can we increase cultural responsiveness in online spaces? Let's take a look at some examples. We're going to do these together. So what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate an online asynchronous discussion. So I want you to go to the chat and I want you to pretend this is the introduction thread. And I want everyone to just introduce themselves the way that they would if they were taking a class. So you say something like, I don't know, hi, my name's Courtney. I you know, am interested in psychology and I'm looking forward to the class or whatever, however you'd introduce yourself. So go ahead to the chat and do that. <clears throat> Give everybody a couple minutes. Just go to the chat, introduce yourself just like you would. I'm not going to pick apart your your intro, so don't worry. <laughs> just go to the chat, start introducing. There you go. Hi, Steve. I really like Steve. <laughs> Hi, Steve. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, I can't start down with cookie or hot chocolate. <laughs> I love it. Betsy, you're my people. Yes, right. So this is great. So it seems to be just based on the chats that we're getting that people are very comfortable in this space um, with each other. Uh, hey, when I'm teaching, I live in Bowling Green. Yeah, I love it from rural West, West Virginia. My mom's, my mom's parents got married in West Virginia. I think it was a sketchy ordeal, not because West Virginia is sketchy, because they were sketchy. Um, yeah, perfect, perfect. So, so this is how we uh, introduce ourselves, right? So, so we're seeing these things in online spaces, and again, maybe if you had the um, ability to share a video, maybe you would have done that. Um, people are sharing kind of uh, they're working on their EDD, um, you know, the snacks that they love what they teach. So perfect. So that's how we would do that. So that doesn't mean we're going to stop asking, right, students to introduce themselves that way. But what we can do is we can add a culturally responsive element to our discussion. So I would ask you the question that I just asked you. But now, let me see, can I just move this forward? There we go. But now I want to ask, yeah, see, it shifted all of these. I want to ask you a different question. So the question is this. If you could talk to an ancestor from 150 years ago or someone who looks like you or communicates like you do, what would you want them to know about your educational experiences or your subject matter? 
So again, if you could talk to an ancestor from 150 years ago, or someone who looks like you from 150 years ago, or someone who communicates like you do, what would you tell them about your educational experiences or your subject matter? And you can post that in the chat. <clears throat> what would you want them to know? What would you want them to know about your experiences? Mm hmm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and these, these, this is a little bit harder, right? Because it's learning biology will change your life, right? Yeah, I did it in one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks different depending on the person. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you for your sacrifice. Allow me to be in the space. Yeah, just that reverence. Yeah, yeah, mm hmm yeah, so so it's just the reverence, right? And it's giving people who want to have the conversation a space to have it and to honor um, people that they may want to honor. And it doesn't mean that we have to ask our uh, our students to tell us everything about their lives, but for the people who wanted to honor someone, <clears throat> one, because it may have been culturally appropriate, two, because it was important to them, um, you know, that's something that they're able to do. And there was a space created to do it. And that's really what the perception piece is in online is it, can I perceive that there's a space that, that is for me and can I have this conversation? And I want to say that um, the pictures that you're seeing, these are not pictures that I picked out myself. Um, we have a culturally responsive teaching certification, and we asked our members um, when they were comfortable with us and we explained the project, would they find pictures that were representative of their family stories, right? This isn't something I'm picking out saying, here, I'm showing you faces. Right. So what you can do with your students is build on that. You can ask your students when they're comfortable with you. Can you share some things um, with me that are representative of your culture, where you come from? Um, and that could be, you know, if you're teaching a class that's global, that could be Kentucky culture versus California culture. It doesn't always have to be race and ethnicity. Um, in this case, um, it's very important if you're at a predominantly white institution, though, this is a very easy way to get um, representation, right, um, early on in a course and talk with your students about it. So. It's just another way to um, kind of help students introduce and think. And, and the time piece is important because it takes people out of here and now, right? And it really kind of just uh, puts them in a different kind of mindset to think about what they want to say. Um, any, any thoughts or um, ideas about the culturally responsive lecture launch or introduction? Are we good, Kim? I think we're probably good. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, perfect. I just like to stop and check. Um, so, so how is that second discussion different than the first one that we did? How was that different? And you can just post. <clears throat> what was different about that second, second discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Respect. Yeah. Right. And here's here's why. Yeah, it's not about. Right. Right. Exactly. It's changing that requires a more thoughtful response. And I love that that you all are picking up on that. And the reason that that's important is because if you look, I think your group uses Blackboard. Is that right? Your campus? Because um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm sure you could probably see something similar in your metadata if you can pull it. Um, <clears throat> if you look over the reason that introductions are so important is because if you look over the data that's associated with plagiarism at your institution, the thing that's most plagiarized is the introduction. So I start off, I write it the first time, my first class, I'm really excited. And then I, oh, you use Ultra, okay. And then you, you, t you take that introduction and you paste it and you paste it and you paste it and you paste it. And you can almost link that to how many plagiarized things are happening, you know, across a course, right? Oh, Blackboard is ultra. Okay, got you, got you. 
All right, I'm not up on black. I've been working with so many universities that use Canvas. I don't even like, I, I need to brush up on my Blackboard equals ultra equals Blackboard ultra equals whatever else it equals. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but, but that's one of those challenges, right? Is, is, is when you're thinking about plagiarism, people just think, oh, hey, this student plagiarized a paper, when in truth, it was more than the, the, the paper, right? It was, it was really the, the introduction. And so that's one of those challenges is that over time, um, we start to miss those pieces and that's happening repeatedly, right? So I'm cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting. And that wh what's happening is that's a behavior, right? That's not a, that's not a learning strategy. It's a behavior. So I did something and I did it and I'm reinforcing it and reinforcing it and reinforcing it. And people are wondering why is it so hard to get students to stop plagiarizing in digital spaces? Well, one of the reasons is, is because we don't change the expectation of the, um, of the introduction because that behavior has been doubled down on, right? So I took my introduction, I'm cutting, pasting, cutting, pasting, cutting, pasting, no one's stopping me. So then no one's going to stop me from my worksheet. No one's going to stop me from my paper. And then they, they're so shocked. Our students are so shocked when they're caught on the paper, but in their head, they're like, well, I've been cutting and pasting for like two years with my introductions. I don't understand the problem. Um, so you want to make sure that, that that's a place that you kind of look at. That's what's called a tier one practice. So let's take a look at what this thing it is called cultural responsiveness. So if we want to do more of what we just did, what does it look like, right? And this is an example from um, for, from uh, Brown University. It's a you know great definition. Nothing nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's so much more than that. Right. It's so much more than that. It, and it, it's all of these things. And I'm not going to read each of these to you, but it's really just kind of picking apart where we're going to be most effective in our classrooms and really thinking about what that means over time with different groups. And I know and I think all of all of you know, because everyone's been kind of teaching long enough that every one of our classes is different. So even if we have the same framework for our class and we teach the same class for 20 years, and we never change our syllabus and we never change our policy. And we, we don't change anything. Our students are very different. Um, we've had, you know, um, there when you when you you know you you have you know one time you have this great class and they're you you know you feel really close and you feel really bonded and then you have this next class and you're like. I don't even know if I want to teach anymore. <laughs> we have those kind of experiences where it can be very, very different. And so one of the things that we can do is think about culture. And this is one of those pieces where we have to ask ourselves, where does culture uh, most influence the online space, right? Well, one, it's group norms. So when we're building groups, and working with students, that's a place where we can really be intentional about culture, right? Because that has to do with trust building. Um, and it also has to do with someone's social identity and how they position themselves in a group. Um, ethnic identity and ethnicity as a whole. Again, I'm not a culture expert. I am an expert in the aspects of culture that influence learning. So um, I'm not an anthropologist. I am not um, uh, you know, a human anthropologist, I, I'm just looking at the cultural aspects of learning. Um, but we know that it makes a difference for academic outcomes and academic feedback, and we'll talk about that as well. So when we're talking about a culture aid of stress, um, we know where it's residing, and it's residing in one of these five areas. And, and please add um, intersectionality to where you see ethnic culture on there. But these are the five areas that, that, are, that are the most important. So if you are going to do cultural responsiveness in your classroom, it doesn't just mean ethnic culture. It doesn't just mean um, you know, race and identity. Culture influences these five pieces. And so you can start with one of these five pieces. And to give an example, this kind of breaks it down, right? So if you were gonna measure out someone's acculturative stress and you were gonna look at those five areas where you could make it better, this is where you would find those pieces. So if you're looking to influence your academic culture, you'd look at planning announcements and policy and content. If you were looking at your cognitive culture and kind of shifting that, you're looking at that divergent thinking piece. If you're looking at the culture surrounding how students are collaborating and you know what their values are for group work or against group work um how many of you are just naturally drawn to group work you just naturally like 
collaborating and not everybody is and that's okay if, if that's not you how many of you are just like yes group work i love working in groups yes yeah, so <laughs> thank you babe. thank you for your honesty anybody else yeah no yeah not me yeah not naturally yeah yeah <laughs> oh, yeah yeah no thanks that is so funny yeah and it's okay right some of us are just naturally hardwired to be in groups and and collaborate and some people aren't and that's okay so the question is is for people who feel that ew and aren't really naturally drawn to group work what can we do um it's a control <laughs> it's a control issue for me yes i enjoy working in group and place name of groups yeah so so again if we're thinking about people who don't naturally do that what is the culture we're building for them in the classroom around collaboration because if people are already feeling ew then we really have to think about how we're putting people in groups what the groups mean what the purpose is, is what the purpose is for the group um then you have community right who are your students? Are your are your students um, are your students really understanding what a sense of community is? Because again, this is that disconnect. So students, um, when you look at the literature, it says, "Oh, sense of community, sense of community, sense of community." But our students don't even know what a sense of community is. So that might be something you want to put in your announcement section, like, "Hey, listen, this these are you know some of the goals that I'm trying to um, develop in this course. This is." These are some of the things I want students to experience. Um, <clears throat> you know, here's what a sense of community means. What does it mean to you, right? So maybe some students are going to say, ooh, I don't need that. And some students are going to say, oh, no, I really would love to connect with someone in the course in the way that I see fit. So you say, well, Courtney, how do you know all this? How do you know that, like, all this works? Well, we know all of it works because if we measure students, and it's really not just students, it's anybody. Um, and that was what was surprising to me about this work. When I started off doing this work, I was focusing on students. And so it's like, oh, students, students, students. But what was interesting to me is I got so many emails from faculty at predominantly white institutions and they were like some of what i was feeling was a cultural difference and some of it was racism when i thought all of it was racism it wasn't it was just a cultural difference and uh, the one woman i'm thinking about in particular um she was she is she's black but she didn't state where she was from so i don't know the the ethnic background um but she was teaching at a university um on a dutch island here in the caribbean and she said um she said i was really struggling and she said but she said just looking at it from the perspective of some of these things are just cultural and i wasn't understanding that cultural difference and she was like there's no question there's still racism there there's still bias like you're not saying that it's one or the other you're just saying that like some of it like it just helped her cope with what she was dealing with because she didn't realize like her brain just went to that that safe um safeguarding right that lifeguarding place and so it really took a lot of stress off her to recognize that some of it was just cultural differences um and so anyway when we when we evaluate uh, a culture of stress in students or individuals we can measure it and depending on the level especially in a learning environment we can see what we would do for a whole group which is the activity we just did with the cultural culturally responsive lecture launch um, that's a tier one so a tier one means it's happening for the whole group so you can do that um, it benefits everybody doesn't harm anybody you can do it not do it it's optional and then we have tier two right which is your your collaboration so when we're moving students into a collaborative learning what has to happen then we know what needs to happen and then let's say that there's a student that's really struggling right maybe they're the only student from pakistan in their um engineering class and they're they're really struggling with the acculturative stress in the classroom and it is in the classroom then there's something else that can be done here and and it can look like um culturally responsive academic feedback which we'll take a look at in a second and i say courtney well why is that important well it's important because there's these if then scenarios and this is where it comes back to people not wanting to get it wrong when we measure this out it lets people know this would be effective this would not be effective right and you can again if you have a good relationship with your students you can talk with them 
you can figure you know out what students need and and all that kind of stuff but but when we're talking about cultural responsiveness people want to guarantee and so measuring it out gives us um i would say 80 to 90 percent accuracy you know obviously not withstanding any you know mental health issues someone has that that's beyond the scope of a teacher or a severe learning disability that's not being um you know supported or or even diagnosed so so the question is, and this is what it looks like just in another in another um table right so tier one practices are for students who and and again assimilation is not saying we want students to assimilate to our culture what it's saying is is that this is how they respond to the culture it's stress so we know that tier if if students are here and they're at a low level of acculturated stress, they only need a tier one practice, a couple of them to be successful. It, we know that if it's medium and their acculturated stress is, is kind of you know mid to, to, I'd say higher than average, but, but mid range, you would need to do the tier one and tier two practices. And if it was really high, let's say there's only five Sudanese students in an entire, you know, all uh let's say they're they're african americans they're at an african american college right that that culture is very different um than sudanese culture and the sudanese students come and they're really struggling right you would need all three of these practices in your teaching all right um we can skip this because i'm looking at the time do you want to take a bio break kim do you want to pull people do you need a break because i i'm I just want to check. No, I, know it's I think you can keep. Is everybody okay? I think we can keep going. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. So, so let's talk about. And these are just this, again. These are just those those things broken out into into another table. Um. So if you were here and you were looking, and on average, this is usually more of your average percentages. So in most of your classrooms, um, you would have tier one is twenty percent. So twenty percent of your students would could benefit right tier two 20 to 50 percent of your students can benefit tier three 50 or more can benefit um and it's also and it also you would have to measure that out and that's not something you as a teacher would do that's something the institution can do or i could do um but you, that's not something for the teacher to do right the educator the faculty member would just learn those strategies and move forward accordingly. Uh, the bigger thing is some of the stuff you might be thinking, wow, this is a lot. The reason that it's a lot is because systems aren't set up to support you with this type of work. And so this summer, was it the summer? Yeah, it was this summer. Um, we just got back. I'm, is anyone else like totally confused? Like, don't, don't you feel like your whole life after COVID, I hate saying after COVID, but like with the pandemic, you used to be able to remember what year it was a lot easier. I feel like after the pandemic, I'm like, I know it's not 2020 because it's not, it was 2020, but I'm like, now I'm like, ah, it's just, it's just a lot. But, um, but so this, so this year we are working with um, 30 colleges to put in a position called a Lodi, which is a learning online diversity, equity, and inclusion officer that solely supports faculty development based on this work. And so we are working with um, Dartmouth, Brown University. Um, we're working with Rutgers, um, New York Institute of Technology. So they're all putting someone in to help support this type of work because, again, this isn't the DIEA umbrella is so big that you're talking about these massive concepts. And I really just have to say this because I have a heart for, for educators. To me, as a clinician, it's a very dangerous place to put people in where you say to people, there is a system that is broken and it's your responsibility to fix it because people only have locus of control of themselves and their area, right? And so if you are a passionate person, you feel like, yes, I am the one person, I don't care, I'm going to do what I need to do to the system or change the system, you do that. But and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I think because of COVID, a lot of educators haven't even had time to breathe themselves. And that's a very, um, that's a very concerning thing for me because people were tired before the pandemic. And then you throw that on top of it with um, just the social change that's been happening in the country. It's been a lot for people. And so I just, I highly urge people just to, um, 
to get the support that you need, whether that's from cool, whether that's from an outside agency, it doesn't have to be the one I work for, but, but just really make sure, you know, self care for yourself and, and, and those around you is, is, um, is also not forgotten about. So what are these tier things look like? Well, we did one already. We did one already. We talked about the culturally responsive lecture launch. So let's talk about two, right? So, or another example of a tier one. So tier one, a tier one is again, something for the community. It's something for your whole group. So one of the things that you could do is you can create a rubric that's based on a sense of community. Um, and there should be one out there floating around. I think I might have posted one on the app. Um, if you want a sample of that, just let me know. Just post in the chat or I could just give one to Kim. But what it looks like is you're, you're asking your class, what is a value to you when you think about a sense of community? And you would have to give them a definition of a sense of community or create one with them. Um, but then you and the class grade the sense of community throughout the class. So if you're on an eight week course, you would do it every two weeks. If you're on a 16 week course, you do it once a month. But just to kind of get a sense of, you know, how are people feeling connected to this space? Because that's one of the biggest challenges for educators is keeping people active and motivated in their class and, um, you know, wanting them to participate. So part of that is, is kind of understanding what are those other pieces of the class that I haven't been taught to keep an eye on, um, that I haven't really given that much thought about. So, so let's do this now. Um, for the attendees, why don't you post in the chat, what is a value that you would like to see someone look for in your online class? When you think about what a sense of community is, bringing people together, um, you know, is it, is it bringing people together? Is it, um, is it civility? Is it, um, you know, respect? What, what are those things that you think that you would like to see if you were grading it and working with your students and your students could grade it? What are some of those inclusion? Thank you, Helen. Yeah, acceptance, trying to help each other, altruism. Sure, sure. Yeah, those are those are great ideas. You can absolutely put those in there, right? And so what you would do is you would just post your graded rubric and then you'd have the students do one and then you'd post it and you'd say, hey, it looks like from my vantage point, it looks like this, but from your vantage point, it looks like this. What can we do to kind of support each other there, or, you know, help help people connect? Um, all right. So so example three, so this is what's, what's considered, yeah, helping others, respecting responses, yeah. And and I have to pause here to, to say this as well. So for LGBTQA students, this is super, super important, um, checking the threads, because what we do know is that it's a big decision for some students to introduce themselves. And there may be a student in your class who is, um, you know, out in parts of their lives, but not in other parts of their life. And so the question is, is, is this online space enough safe to share, to introduce myself the way my peers are, right? So let's say Kim introduces herself and she says, hi, I'm Kim, you know, I, and I don't know if this is true, I'm just making this up. Hi, I'm Kim, I'm married, I have 2.5 kids and a dog, right? Maybe I wanna introduce my partner that same way, but I have to really give, you know, thought to that. So one of the things that we see, a trend in online spaces that we see is that we have LGBTQA students who will just kind of post the bare minimum in the intro. And then after that, what they'll do is they'll, maybe like in week two or three, they'll say something about their partner. And what we know is um, in a lot of cases, the responses to that student will go down because people don't know what to say because they may have thought the person was straight in per their announcement, but maybe they feel a certain way and they don't know, what to say, so they say nothing, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. And the, the challenge with that is, is if you look at the data on the back door of that, what you'll notice is to the instructor, it looks like, oh, the student ghosted, they're not around, the, I've reached out, I've been reaching out, reaching out. But what we know is, is that they actually are logging in, but they're just going back to that one post. They're waiting for more responses to continue to participate. If that one post isn't really addressed either by the um, the, the faculty or the, the peers, they, they kind of get stuck on that one post and it's just re-victimizing themselves repeatedly. So just make sure at least once 
um, a course or a term. Um, best practice is usually once every other week, but you scan your discussions for the students who you see that the engagement with them among their peers has dropped off because that could be an indicator of something else. So again, yeah, yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, it, so again, teachers, educators, faculty members, I don't know what it is about groups and collaboration, but they love putting, we do, we, I'm an educator, I love putting students in groups, I'm not going to lie, um, and everyone has their way. So someone share with me how you put your students in groups, because I know that some people are like, you know, if you're, if you're Sagittarius, come to this side, right, Capricorn's over here, or, you know, it's your birthday, right, or, so, so what are some of the techniques that you use? Video flips, co-created, oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, what are some of those grouping strategies you use? Random assignment, right? Random. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Most people use random assignment. They really do. They say, okay, count off by threes, or I'm going to use a, you know, a, a, a gener, you know, a, uh, what's it called? Amy used one earlier. You know, the random generator thing where people, you know, these numbers are over here, these numbers are over here. Um, and it is random. And most of the time we do random. And when it's a homogeneous group, random is usually okay. The challenge is, is that again, cultural considerations of collaborative learning are time, how long it takes someone to feel comfortable in a group, right? Because this is this whole safe versus brave space debate too, right? So somebody came up with the term safe space, and they're like, oh, it's safe space, safe space. Well, it's not safe if I don't feel safe, and I also have to be brave to be in these groups that people think are safe that aren't really safe. So it just creates this, it's because people didn't think that through, right? Um, cultural variance, yeah, exactly, yep. Type indicators, perfect. Um, sense of identity, right? And how I feel in this group. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you, Amy is going to post, um, uh, our, our second activity. So this is something that you can do. And you won't, you don't have all the pieces for this yet, so that's okay. So you can um, use the link in the chat or, or use a QR code. What is most important to you for working in a group? And since we don't have discussions, I can't let you talk about the why. Um, if you want to share your why in the chat, you can. But what, which of these are the most um, in, important to you when working in a group? Is it that someone has a respect for your specific realities, meaning that someone understands your world orientation and kind of your experiences? Is it time for complex storytelling and understanding so people can share, um, you know, their, your, you know, the, you can share with people stories and you can listen to people's stories? Is it observable correction where you want to make sure that, you know, the people that you're working with, if they're not doing their work, someone's looking, they're, 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 they know it, there's some sort of mechanism to say, hey, this person's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Is it the sharing of communal resources? Is it extended time for social greetings? Or is it harmony? So go ahead and click that. And we've got, okay. All right, you guys are on it. We're almost done here, so we are doing, we are right on time. All right, a couple more coming in. And respect for specific realities. All right. So here are your findings. I'll present this. Can you all see that? I don't know. All right, so for the people who participated, we have respect for specific realities is at its, let me make sure, yes, okay, perfect. Um, we have respect for specific realities and harmony are our two top contenders. Then we have communal resources next, followed by extended time and complex storytelling, which are those two, and then observable correction, right? And so, there's no right or wrong answers here, right? It's just your preference. There's, there's no, you know, there's no, um, oops, now I have to go back to my PowerPoint. I'm still learning. I was, I was, uh, I'm, I have so many 
slides, so I'm trying to go back to them efficiently. All right, so everybody picked everybody picked their um, everybody picked their what's what was important to them. Okay, now what you didn't know was that I randomly picked um, cultural attributes of culture which are most important to group work. So again, what what when we're talking about cultural responsiveness. One of the things that we're we're doing is saying we're, what we're not doing is saying because someone is black or because someone is Asian, this is what they want. We're not making assumptions. What we're doing is saying, I really have a missed opportunity. I can put students in random groups, or I can let students really kind of explore those other parts that may be important to them in a safe way and they can see commonality with people who may not may or may not be reflective of themselves right so and what these attributes these, this research comes out of um counseling psychology right and so what you're looking at is the your the most likely the most likely attributes that would help someone get content from point a to point b so if i have this knowledge and I want to give you this knowledge, share with you this knowledge, have you, sh you know, learn this knowledge in a group setting and culture is at the forefront of what I'm trying to do, what would be my best chances? And you can understand why um, culturally um, and African-American culture specifically, if you were resistant to talking about George Floyd, um, you could see how that could be very offensive to someone's sensibilities because that is a specific reality of the community. It doesn't mean of the individual. It means if you are African American, you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who had an experience similar to George Floyd, whether it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, yesterday. And so that's just an example, right? Now, you may have picked respect for specific realities and you're not from the African American community, but that's something that's important to you. So you want to show people where they can they can have commonality. Um, I'm going to just kind of move through this a little bit quicker. So, so now let's say we we're working with an individual student they're really struggling they're 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 really looking at you know how do i how do i make this work why why am i struggling in this class and this is this is considered a, a because you're you're looking at cognitive culture and you're looking at how cognitive culture how you can influence cognitive culture so a lot of times when you look at how we ask students to think about things it usually comes down to two of these things there's some clear objective that we've created and then there's consultative facilitation, which means I'm going to teach you something and I'm going to then consult you and facilitate why that is or is not correct. But when you look at something like African American culture in particular, that culture really values strength based learning. So if you use a deficit model of teaching and starting from all the things you don't know, um, that's creating a barrier between you and that student. And again, if you can't show the respect for specific realities, that would be a challenge. And so you think, so, okay, Courtney, well, what does that look like grading wise? Well, a tier three practice um, of cultural responsiveness is something called culturally responsive academic feedback. And so what that looks like is, again, if you were to look at, if you were to pull any feedback that you've ever learned to do, right? Let's, let's say you could go back to that that PD that you learned how to do academic feedback. Um, you, there, it, it's very Eurocentric in nature, okay? Um, and so what you have is that consultative facilitation, you have a self-reflection, which is, you know, think about blah, blah, blah. Then you have um, the Dutch influence, which is the focus on what's right. So there's the right way. And then you have the German culture, which is a balance of leadership and empathy. And if you need an example of that, think of the sandwich method. How many of you know what the sandwich method is, right, for feedback? Are you familiar with that? Say something nice, then then say something nice, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the challenges with that is if, if I don't trust you, what do I believe? Do I believe that everything's good? Because you're saying two of two very juxtaposing things at once. Right. This is really good. But right. 
And then, but, but it's really good. Okay, but was it the first but or the second but, right? Um, and then Irish is the importance of the individual contribution. But when we look at African American culture, and the reason that I kind of just use African American culture, particularly when I'm training in the US is because they're so juxtaposed historically and um, logistically, it's just a good place to start. So, but if you were doing it based in culture, and you really want students to read your feedback, and you really want them to value more of what you're trying to do, um, a narrative would work better. Um, starting with a strength based perspective would work better showing demonstrating that the student to the students that a lot of people in the class may be having that same challenge right um, and then communicating and highlighting specific um, what's what's important historically so an example of that would be let's say you teach a, you're teaching a writing class and you want your student to write a paper they write a paper they turn it in and you're struggling with them documenting something right using um using citations and things like that well one of the things that you could discuss and we have this this is written out in the book and we've had people do examples in the trainings but one of the best examples is you know during slavery the reason people don't know their history is because people didn't document properly and so when your student is writing a story or writing a paper, you want their voice to be documented appropriately. You're showing that there's a historical time where people didn't respect that enough, right? And so then you're bringing it to the forefront. Yes, Elizabeth, yes, exactly, exactly. So I'm gonna stop there because I know we have about 15 minutes left, but but the final thoughts are, you know, I don't, I don't want faculty to have to guess. Um, we can measure these things out to give you a better um, sense of what those skills are and what works and what doesn't. Um, faculty and students deserve the benefit of more structured teaching. And you know, start small and think big. When you think about culture, think of the the one of those five areas. And you, it doesn't have to start all over the place. It can start with your whole group, a collaborative, or an individual. And just think connection because it's how people um, really kind of frame what they do in their life. And it's a value. And everyone can learn something from everyone. And and I'll tell you, um, the reason this work is so important to me is because. You know, I always, when I was younger, so my, my dad's black and my mom's white, and my cousins on both sides who are my age, we all have very different experiences, but I always envied them because, you know, I take, when people talk about racism and stuff, I take it very seriously, um, only because, you know, unlike my, my cousins on either side, I always wanted to be one of them. I didn't care if I was black and I didn't care if I was white um, because I didn't learn racism in the street. I learned it in my home. So I didn't go to school and people were mean to me. It was my mom's brothers. It was my blood relatives, right? And so, so when you're talking about things like racism, um, I, I, I always wanted, I, I was like, well, if I was black, like my cousins, you'd be affirmed in your home, right? You'd have, you'd have your family to come home to and they'd be like, yep, that's the way it is. Um, or my white cousins is like, oh, well, that's just the way that that is. But when you're biracial and, and, and that's this, I'm not speaking for all biracial people, just my own experience is, um, you know, so, so this, it, and it, it comes down to that is unequivocally an issue. And I know what people say in their homes because I was in that home. That's how I, was that's who I was raised around. So I, I, I know what it is. And I know that some of my relatives would never say that in the street, but they say it in their homes. And so it's, 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 um, it's a thing, you know, and it's a real thing. And it doesn't mean that everyone is a racist, but it means that we all have blind spots. And, you know, when I look at cultural responsiveness, it's just a way to help people heal and connect. Um, it does, it's, it's a very small part. It's not the part, but, um, but I just, any, any way that I can support faculty and students and in, in coming together is something that, um, that I'm happy to do. Um, but I like sharing my own story just because I think that's, it's, it's just an important piece. So if you could, um, just take, um, this last, um, second and just do your takeaway. What's your one word takeaway from this, um, from this session? 
um, you can post it there and I will post that for you. And I have to tell you, thank you so much. Uh, this has been difficult for me. So I'm not at home. I'm, I'm in the Caribbean. We had a, um, we're working with a group that wants to start a college. And so we've been online this whole time. And so I flew down here and the internet has been looking like it's like going off and on and off and on. And so um, I really appreciate you hanging in there with me because I was just hoping that no one was going to post like, oh, I can't hear you or I can't see or I never uh, do well without my own internet and my my home stuff. So thank you for um, giving me some grace on that. And if there are any questions, I'll just stay on. Otherwise, um, super, super excited to um, to see what else. Um, unsettled, inspiring, open, diverse, kindness. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And whoever said unsettling, I'm sorry. If, if you want to talk later, we absolutely can. <laughs> so, all right. Um, all the notes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All of the notes are in, um, are in the um, app. You get there's all of the um, all the PowerPoints. You can have access to that through there. So, okay, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I thank you for like I said, thank you for being gentle with me because I was losing my train of thought when I was seeing the internet <laughs> flickering. I was like, oh man, it was fine this whole time. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. Oh yeah, Leah, yeah, you'll have your your side of notes, yeah. So Kim, do you want me to stay on here or what do you need me to do? It looks like we don't have any questions, just a, a lot of people okay. expressing their appreciation. Um, I don't know if you've got many responses for your word cloud from your little form. If you I did, I do, I do, we do. Yeah, I did, that's what I say. Um, kindness, open, new, working, understanding, inclusive, gratitude, belonging, um, understanding, responsive, thankful, inspiring, diversity, openness, kindness, belonging, gratitude, good. Awesome. Well, yeah. then I would like to thank you again for presenting. Um, for everyone else, as far as our schedule goes, we have um, just over an hour for you all to go grab some lunch before we start our first sessions. And those will start at um, 1230 Eastern Time, 1130 Central. So we'll see you back. And as um, Leah mentioned in her introduction, you just go to that that cool conference website to find access to your rooms. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. So thank you again, Dr. Plotz. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it because like I said, I was watching the internet and I was just like, so I'm just trying to get through it. And I was like, oh, so I'm sorry if it was kind of all over the place. I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm just hoping that I could get through this with the internet. So um yeah, so I'll be back at whatever time and just if there's something you need in the meantime, just um hit me up on the or text me or whatever that sounds great thank All you right, thank you take care bye 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 oh kim sorry one more thing yes oh, can i just click this purple button is that how i get out i just don't want to shut down all your people because i'm a presenter if you